anyone at any age on any income can absolutely achieve financial freedom through passive income. Mm -hmm. I truly believe that. If I could do it on $36,000 within three years without really having any financial help, then anybody out there can do the same thing. Hey everybody, welcome to The Real Estate Rundown. Hey, you guys are gonna wanna stay tuned for this upcoming episode of The Real Estate Rundown. We are going to have my lovely guest, Rachel Richards, give us some tips. I'll tell you, here's a little bit about a lady that should impress the heck out of you and make you wanna come back. So here's a short intro. 27 years old, she quits her job, right? She's retired. She's living off of $15,000 a month in passive income. Rachel is also a best-selling author. She's got two books out, Money Honey and Passive Income Aggressive and Retirement. She's a former financial advisor, so she really knows her stuff, and a real estate investor with almost 40 units. Sorry guys, she's already married, but you're gonna wanna come back, stay tuned and figure out why she's been able to help thousands of millennials work their way out of financial despair through understanding with her fabulous material. So guys, be sure to tune into the Real Estate Rundown. We'll be right back. Hey guys, welcome to the Real Estate Rundown. Today, my guest, as promised, Rachel Richards. Rachel, hi. Hey, thank you so much for having me. So you never ask a woman her age. My mom taught me this, but it says right here that you retired at 27 and you don't look a day over 25. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. I'm 28 now. Oh, <laughs> retired at 28. How in the world is the question you always get asked, but how in the world did you do it? Yeah, so high level overview we, my husband and I started creating passive income in 2017. So before that, we didn't have any passive income, no extra income or side hustles or anything. That year, we bought our first rental property, which was a duplex in Louisville, Kentucky. And then later that year, I wrote and launched my first best-selling book, Money Honey. So we had these two passive income streams, rental income and royalty income. And we focused on growing those as much as possible over the next few years. So fast forward to today, we now own almost 40 doors, 40 rental units, and I now have two books. And between those two streams, we're bringing in 15 grand a month. So I've got a couple of questions for you. I've always thought I should get some royalty money, but come to find out I'm not related to any royalty. Um, <laughs> what, is it, what is it like to write a book? I mean, what is that whole process like? And, and is it really worth it? Oh gosh, stressful, scary, exhilarating, humbling. I mean, there's, you go through the whole range of emotions for sure. I, it really, I felt compelled to write this book, Money Honey. I used to be a financial advisor and that's really more a sales job when you're first starting out. Yeah. So I didn't love it. And I wanted to find a way to really continue to impact people and help them with finance. Cause that's what I was passionate about. So it was very exciting at first writing the book, but then about four months in, I quit writing altogether. By that time, I had done a total mental 180. I was telling myself things like, Rachel, who do you think you are to write a book about finance? You know, you're a 24-year-old you're a woman who's going to listen to you. And your writing is crap. And if you go through with this, it'll be embarrassing. So those were the things I was telling myself. Really nice, right? Um, yeah, I was going to say, wait a minute, Rachel. Wh wh where was your other angel telling you that other guy to be quiet? <laughs> I know and he must have disappeared for a little bit, but luckily I sat down with a good friend, told her about this book. And she said, Rachel, you need to finish out what you set, what you set out to do. You're really onto something here, you know, please finish this project and publish it. And I'm grateful for that because she gave me just enough reassurance and encouragement that I did. I basically, in the end, the only reason I went through with it is because I told myself if I can just help one person, that's all I want to do. And I think if I had been out to make some quick money grab, people would have seen right through that and the book wouldn't have done as well. But thankfully I did because it became more successful than I ever would have imagined. So obviously, I, I mean, I, I, I want to read the book, uh, but, but how did you take your background at sales in uh, financial planning, right? Which... We, we know what that is, right? It's, it's not about being successful. It's about becoming part of the machine, right? Of putting your money to work in somebody else's machine and sitting on the sidelines while you continue to do your day job until they allow you to retire, right? 
What was it like to write that book, knowing that that book was probably not in pure alignment with what you had been doing in the past? Yeah, it was weird because I used to be a financial advisor, sales job. I eventually quit that and I I took some stints in real estate and then I became a finance analyst. Writing the book was totally different because I was moving from something that was a secure salaried position. I was going to get paid no matter what, even if I did a bad job that week, I was going to get paid based on the hours I put in and then moving to something that was totally risky. I I truly didn't know if I was going to make a single dollar from my book. And even in the beginning, I've always been a very frugal person. So I was thinking to myself, I don't want to invest thousands of dollars into this book launch and maybe not make that back. So I launched Money Honey for less than $600. And even then, I didn't know if I was going to make $600 off of it. So, And that's why I think I had so much trouble leading up to the launch because it's a very vulnerable thing. Putting your work out there for other people to see and judge and not even know if you're going to make money from it, that's one of the scariest things I think you can do. So it was imposter syndrome I was dealing with, but thankfully I went through with it. Well, yeah. And, you know, the reality is, too, when you're sitting there talking about, uh, you know, what people need to do to become something, you've got everybody that's that's being an armchair quarterback, having not done it or having done it. You've got everybody's Uncle Sam, who's never uh, done anything on his own. He's just taken 37 percent. Oh, wait, that sounds like my Uncle Sam. Uh, you know, but you've got everybody else as a critic, right? Everybody else is telling you why it, you, what you're saying isn't right. And so you're putting you're putting it out there and you can't take print back right what has been your response once you got it out there overwhelmingly positive feedback and i truly still felt like a fraud i felt like an imposter even the six months after the book launch because at first you know all your friends and family are buying it they're all supporting you of course they're doing that but it did it took a while for me to actually get random feedback from strangers on the internet that allowed me to change my mindset and realize, wow, I've put something out there that's really good. And so I started getting emails from people all over the country and even the world saying, thank you so much for writing this book. You've helped me. I'm so grateful for you. And that was cool. And then on the flip side, of course, when you put something out there and people can leave reviews, you're going to get bad reviews no matter what, right? Mm -hmm. They say you're not a real author until you get your first one-star review. So it was hard at first because it's interesting how we'll believe the one one one-star review over the 500 five-star reviews. Right. And so that part was hard too. But now I, sometimes I get a one-star review and they're just so funny. I've just learned to laugh at it. And I'm, so now I do a lot better with that. Yeah. Well, and, you know, especially from the place where it's worked for you, you know, if you really were to look at the balance sheet of the one-star review versus your balance sheet, I'm sure that the tail would be in the tape. So to Yeah. Speak, I mean, right? Money Honey has over 700 five-star reviews now, so right. I'm not too worried about the, you know, 10. And how many copies reviews. have you sold? I've sold over 20,000 copies. 20,000 copies. Wow. Okay. That's amazing. You know, I was asked the other day by someone if I would like to write a book and I would love to write a book. However, for all the reasons you said, imposter syndrome, all that other stuff, I don't know that I'm going to write a book. So so my hat is off to you for doing that. Now, let's get back to what fueled the book. Let's get back to you. You bought a duplex and you thought, wow, I bought a duplex. I need to write a book. Walk us through walk us through that where out of that whole process you came up with the idea for the book, what fleshed out the book and, and where you took it. So money, honey, I came up with the idea because all my family and friends came to me for financial advice, which I loved. That's what I love to do. Mm-hmm. At the same time though, I began to wonder, well, why aren't they reading books or learning on their own? And then I had this aha moment where I realized, oh yeah, personal finance is boring. <laughs> Right. right. For most people, it's intimidating. It's complex. It's dry. No wonder people don't like to learn about it. So I thought to myself, how can I make this topic sassy and simple and fun? And that's where the idea for Money Honey came from. So I actually started writing it before we invested in real estate. And at the time, and it, it still is, my book is about the basics of money management, you know, uh, savings, budgeting, debt payoff, investing. 
And it wasn't until a few years later that I started investing a lot more in real estate and learning about passive income. That's when I wrote my second book, Passive Income Aggressive Retirement. And that one is a lot more about the real estate investing. Okay. Okay. So you're involved in this process. Financial advice is your thing. You get involved in a duplex. It's everything you thought it was, right? It was simple. It was easy. There was no pain, no bumps, right? I mean, yeah, not at all. Like the book, right? A, a dream, a total dream. No. Yeah. <laughs> what happened? How was that? You know, the, I held myself back from investing in real estate for a long time for a couple reasons: lack of money. I thought I would need a ton of money to do it, and lack of knowledge and experience. You know, I felt like I need to learn more. I need to read more so that I don't make mistakes when I first invest in real estate. And it took me a while to realize. I'm going to make mistakes no matter how prepared I am. So once I got over that hump and just accepted the fact that I was going to make many mistakes, mistakes which would cost me time, mistakes which would cost me money, that's when I was able to get started. And that first deal, it was very scary. It, it was a duplex in Louisville, Kentucky. You go from feeling this hope and this non-tangible thing of, okay, maybe I can make this work with real estate. Maybe I can leave my job, retire early gain financial independence. And there's this hope and this fear. And then once you get that first rental property, it's kind of like the light bulb goes on and you're like, okay, I can see now how this is going to work. This is what I'm going to do. So that first one, I just think it's always such an exciting moment because you can see the reality of what it could be. And that's what it was for me. Then the, f the years that followed that first duplex, my husband and I were addicted to finding rental properties and acquiring and building out our empire. So you, you, you mentioned your husband. What is his take on your book success? He's very proud. He is so supportive, brags to people about it. It's very sweet. <laughs> did, did he come up with the title? No, no, I probably, did. He probably would have come up with Sugar Mama or something like that, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know? uh, but, you know, it, it, but it sounds like you guys have a, a partnership in the deal. We do. So a lot of people ask, where do we get the money for our first deal? So we had a few things going for us. First of all, we both graduated from college without student debt, not because our parents paid for it. I, pay, I paid my way through school selling Cutco cutlery, Cutco mm -hmm. knives. So mm -hmm. I did a sales job. Yep. Andrew is a veteran. So he used his military benefits to pay for school. Thank you, sir, for your service. Thank you. Yeah. So we both graduated without debt, which was gave us a huge advantage. And I always tell people, you know, I'm not a trust fund baby. I never made six figures from a job or a career. My first job out of college, I was making $36,000, but I didn't have any debt. Right. And I was being very, very frugal. I was trying to figure out a way to save half of my income even then. So it didn't take long for us to build up a small amount of savings. Mm -hmm. In 2017, I was 24 at the time, we found the duplex. It was $100,000. So we knew we needed to come up with 20 grand for the down payment. So by then we each had put $10,000 in to get us that first duplex. So are your parents involved in real estate? No neither of our parents. So where did this come from? Uh, you know, I think the first memory I have of t being turned on to real estate was uh, reading the rich dad, poor dad in okay. high school, okay. because I I've been a finance nerd my whole life, proud finance nerd over here. And I read tons well, of $15,000 a month of passive income. I don't think it's, uh, I don't, I think it's pretty evident that you <laughs> well to the subject. It's not a surprise. Yeah. Not I read surprise. tons of books throughout middle school, high school, college. And I think I read rich dad, poor dad in high school and became obsessed with learning everything I could. So that's where it came from. And really okay. the desire to, become financially independent and not have to rely on somebody else to take care of myself. Mm -hmm. There were just some fears, some li limiting beliefs growing up, feeling like my family didn't have as much money as other families that I knew where I just had these motivations to kind of grow out of that and become right. financially independent. Okay. So what is it that, what is it that you really want to get through in the topic the topics of your books. I mean, what is the, what is the thrust? If there is just one, what is the thrust of your, of your writing? If there's just one, I, I tend to be so passionate about passive income lately. So it's this message. It's that anyone at any age on any income 
can absolutely achieve financial freedom through passive income. Mm -hmm. I truly believe that. If I could do it on $36,000 within three years without really having any financial help, then anybody out there can do the same thing. Right. Wow. That's powerful. You know, I, we all have, uh, because Anthony uh, or Tony Robbins is, is so prolific in what he does, you know, you've, you've probably heard him talk about what does retirement really look like? And, and he, you know, he takes people through that process, but I have yet to meet someone at the ripe old age of 28 that has actually taken those words to heart and has actually quit their job. Now, I understand that you say retired. Yeah, let's talk about that. <laughs> yes. Because people are like, well, Rachel, you're not retired. You're still working. Right? Is, is that where you were going to go with that? I think so. <laughs> okay. I, I think you've so, heard this question before. <laughs> I have. Yes. So absolutely. Here's, here's the thing. I use the words retired and financially independent interchangeably. So yes, a lot of people retire and they, you know, they sit on the beach for the rest of their lives. And that's great. Truly, I wish I could be more like that. My problem though, is that I get bored so easily. So what brings me fulfillment is building and creating and continuing to add value to people's lives. So what I do now, I spend most of my time um, either hiking or traveling around Colorado or working on my book business, you know, writing my next book, creating my next course. But the point is that I now work when, where, and if I want. Mm -hmm. I don't have to work anymore. Right. I do it because I want to and because it, that's what brings me fulfillment. And the reality is it doesn't matter if you do or don't, your income will be the same. Right, right. Yeah. And, and that brings me to another great topic, which is, pa is passive income truly passive? Is anything ever going to be 100% hands off? And what, the way I look at it, maybe portfolio income is truly passive where you put a bunch of money in the stock market and you're earning dividends. Maybe that's the only one. The rest of the passive income streams, though, they generally will require you know, a couple hours a week or a few hours a month to maintain. You just have to maintain them. But the way I look at it is that's much more passive compared to a 40 hour a week job. So, I mean, and this is the thing, right? That everybody asks is, well, would you rather put in, let's say, I'm just going to make some guesses here. Let's just say that you put in 80 hours a week for three years. I'm, get, I'm betting you probably didn't quite put in that much, but let's just say that you did. You put in 80 hours a week for three years. You lived like you were working 25 hours a week. You saved up a massive amount. And now at the age of 28, average lifespan of 90, you are going to spend the 50 years you were supposed to spend working for someone else, doing whatever you want, whenever you want. And you're saying that you're not, I mean, you've got to put in three to five hours a week mm -hmm. to maintain that means that at the end of your working life, even with the 80 hours that you put in, you still have not worked seven full years in your whole life. Yeah, that's actually, <laughs> right? you know, I should do the I math mean, on that, but that's do so the math true. on that. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I don't think, I mean, and I'm not calling you lazy, but, no. but at the end of it all, you, you know, when you look at that, it's about being being passionate about where you put your time and your effort. And now to be able to dictate where you do what you do is so amazing. So let me ask you this. You, you mentioned you were going to be, you know, you're continuing to work on your book. You're continuing to hike. You're continuing to do this. Are you going to continue to grow your real estate portfolio? So great question. And I think that we have determined we are not. The last property we bought was in 2018. And here's the thing that I love about real estate investing, because I do think it's incredible. I think every young person should own real estate. It's one of the best tools for building long-term wealth. For us, though, it was never something I was so passionate about that I wanted to grow this huge empire and own 100 or 200 rental units. For me, it was a means to an end. Once we got to a point with it where we were generating $10,000 a month in profit consistently, that's all we wanted. And that was enough money to allow us to, fr to free us up to do the other things that we love to do. Right. So if anything, at this point, we are thinking about selling, potentially selling some of our properties and transitioning into something even more passive, such as real estate syndication. Mm -hmm. You know, and that, that's kind of my, it's kind of where I was going with that is that, you know, when you look at what you've done, you've, you've, your timing in the market is, 
pretty great. I mean, you know, we were in a recovery, you know, you didn't catch it at the bottom, but you're sure not buying at the top. Yeah. Um, and, and to be able to have the growth that you've had, you know, that's the thing that a lot of people, that, that a lot of people forget about real estate or they don't, it's not that they forget. It's just that it's, 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 a, it's a side effect or it's, I, 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 I'm not saying this very well, but it's, it's a side benefit to the passive income. Every month that the that you're continuing to receive passive income, you're also your future value of that property is going up as well. So at the end of your time, you've fed your whole life off of the money that's come in. And at the end of the 30 years, you've done the deal with the bank, you've paid off the loan, and now you have an asset that should be worth three or four or five times what you paid for it with no bank note on it. So like your student your lack of student loan debt, you came through that process without having to make monthly payments down the road 30 years when you're the ripe old age of 57, these will all be paid off and you will have 40 properties that will be free and clear. That is not why you did that. You did it for the passive income, but you have all this other additional value that a lot of people don't look at because they're too busy focusing on the passive income. And yeah, that's I mean, the there's, thing. Yeah, there's so many benefits. You have the equity buildup, which as you said, so after 30 years, you own a property free and clear, having only paid the down payment. You have tax benefits and depreciation. You have the passive income or the cash flow, and you have the potential for appreciation and the property right. to grow even more yeah. in value. I mean, you what investment is better than that? I, right. I don't personally know. So that's why I love it. <laughs> Yeah, no, and that's and that's amazing. You know, the thing that that a lot of people forget is that it is really that easy. You know, um, but they uh, we like to make it hard, right? Yeah. We like to make ourselves think that it's hard so that we don't do it. I always think that the harder it is, that means I'm gonna do it, right? <laughs> I mean, because I don't like to do anything the easy way, right? But that's yeah, just, you like a challenge. <laughs> I like a challenge. You know. Um, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not, I don't know that I'll ever walk away from real estate and what I do. I am passionate about real estate as well. Um, and I'm not passionate about the passive income. I'm passionate about the creation. You know, mm. I'm passive. Uh, I'm passionate about seeing, seeing the, the opportunity to take this from this bare land to a finished project, take this group of investors to a bunch of people in a room that don't know each other, bring them together, create something, and everybody gets what they want out of it, whether it's, you know, fishing with your cousins or, or you know, sitting on the beach or writing another book, you know. Um, and so, but it's, it's awesome to see that that vehicle is there for everyone, regardless of what they want to do with it when they're done. So, oh, for sure. Yeah. So, you're not even 30, what do what do your thirties have in store for you? I mean, what are your plans for your future long term? Um, yeah, I I am focused on a few different projects um, next year. I'm thinking I might do write my next book about real estate investing because my platform has been asking me for more content. So I know there's a need. So I'm mm-hmm. excited about that. And then. Next year, actually, my husband and I are going to slow travel around the Western U.S. for six months. So we're going to hit up all the national parks, do a little bit of travel. That'll be fun. Um, And then maybe settle down somewhere, even though that makes that scary for me to say out loud. I don't I don't like commitment, (laughs) but but we'll see. I don't try. I try not to think that far ahead. (laughs) You know, but but this is I I guess the, the irony of my comment is just now dawning on me. I'm talking to a. Uh, I'm, guys, I'm talking to Rachel Richards, who's 28 years old, has already living a passive income lifestyle. So she does not have to get up and go to work every day. She, she can't think past next year. She doesn't want to commit to next year. But y'all have committed to 50 years of grinding it out, 40 years of grinding it out at your day job to get to a retirement that isn't, isn't as secure as where she's at at 28. So guys, I want you to think about that. I mean, Rachel has figured out how to do that with passive income. She's written two books, mind you, Money Honey and Passive Income Aggressive Retirement that give you the keys and the tips to making sure that you can do what she's done at any age, right? Um, 
I, I'm I'm just uh, I'm a little bit in awe, really. I mean, you are uh, you know you're you're 20 years younger than me, um, and you are doing what you want with your life, which is how life's supposed to be. It really is. I I, I commend you. What yeah. is it that if if my audience was wanting to know the one character trait that you and your husband had that got you from the starry-eyed couple that thought about real estate to the retired couple, what is that one character trait? That character trait is the ability to execute. Mm. Okay. Knowledge means nothing without execution. We all know what we should be doing in general, right? We all know to spend less money and pay off debt and invest in the stock market and invest in real estate. So why don't we do it? It's because self-discipline is so hard. Really taking the next step and actually implementing on that knowledge, that's the hardest part. Mm -hmm. So if you can move beyond those fears and move beyond consumption to a point where you know, okay, it's time to take action. That's really, I think, what sets apart people who can achieve financial freedom and people who just can't quite get there. Mm, that makes a lot of sense, you know, because I, I think whether it's, you know, this time of year and all the goodies that are, you know, coming up uh, and and being able to say no to that or financially doing the same thing and, and actually being able to save money and not buy the new PS5 uh, or not get the new car or not do, uh, you know, the big, the big vacations um, to do the things that make you, you know, it's putting in the work ahead of time and getting the reward. Well, in your case, three measly years later, um, you know, I, I just, I mean, I, I, Honestly, I just, I can't help but come back to that thought process that here you are, you have, you're, you're 28 years old and your life is yours to pick what you want to do. And I, you know, I'm, uh, I'm a little more overwhelmed by, by sitting in, in uh, the shadow of your genius here oh, because, <laughs> because of the reality that, you know, here you are, this is what, and you know, most people plan their whole lives to do. You did in a very short period of time because you, you were able to get that concept of executing and staying with the plan. How I appreciate hard, how that. How hard was that? It was, it was hard. I, I just, oh, I, I think it's easy to look at somebody else's success story and say, wow, you know, it must be great. Look at that. That looks so easy. But what you don't see is the years of struggle and exhaustion and crying and stress. <laughs> and don't, those don't are talk all... about your husband's crying on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those are all true things. And I think you're right, though. I think we did work 80 hour weeks for three yeah. years. But who wouldn't trade that? Right. And it's it would be. Yeah, I mean, I look back and I'm like, OK, would I do it again? It was so hard at the time, but at the same time. I think it was worth it because here I am now and, and right. I, I don't ever have to do that again. So, but it is hard. You know, I did deal with mental health issues at, at times during my journey where it was just too much. It was too much. I was trying to put on my plate and I didn't do a good job of having boundaries and protecting my mental health and making time for myself. Um, so I did deal with anxiety. I did deal with depression at one point and those were really hard experiences, but I'm also grateful for those in hindsight because I learned some very important lessons. I learned how to say no. You know, a lot of people say you should say yes to every opportunity that comes your way. And I think that's true when you're starting out, right? When you're first starting out as a real estate investor, yeah, you want to go look at every opportunity out there to find a good one. When you're first starting out as a business owner, you want to hustle and get your name out there. But the problem I had is that that's only true up to a point. And then you have to learn how to say no, because if not, your calendar will fill up with everyone else's priorities except for your own. Right. So the lesson I had to learn was just setting those boundaries, protecting my time and learning that saying no is actually a lot more powerful than saying yes. Well, you know, I, I, I have a saying that I use a lot. The most expensive thing you can own is, is a closed mind, you know, uh, but that doesn't mean that you have to go do everything that every opportunity that comes across. You should look right. Um, I looked at Bitcoin. Right. I looked at investing in uh, a lot of things. I've looked at a lot of multi-level marketing companies and I've looked at a lot of that. Doesn't mean I've done it. 
right? It doesn't mean that I let it chew up my time and my calendar because I had very specific things that I was looking at and doing. But the reality is, if you really, I mean, you have not even, if, if you look at the time that you put in from 24 to 27, that three years was a very compressed, but it was also very accelerated uh, workflow, right? Yes. I mean, you, you got done, Elon Musk says, you know, say, say that you're going to do it. You say that you're going to work 120 hours a week, you know, you're not going to, but you're going to get a lot more done than the person that works 40, right? Mm-hmm. If you, yeah. if you put your 10 year goal into a one year time frame, you're probably not going to get it done, but you're going to get a lot more done than the guy that never does it. That never yeah. says I'm going to do 10 years worth of work in one year. Right. Exactly. Exactly. I always set really big, scary goals for myself. And it's rare that I actually meet the goal. It's rare. I actually hit the goal, but by setting those big goals, I get a lot farther than if I had set something more realistic. So yeah, I totally agree. You know, that's funny because I find a lot of times that I set goals that I think are big, but I always achieve them. Mm. But now that I'm looking at yours, I wonder if I've been underachieving because, because the way that you look at it is interesting because if you've set a goal out there that's so big, so hairy, so audacious that even in your best year, you can't achieve it. And I've looked at it for the last five years, I've achieved my goals. Maybe I could have done more. Now all of a sudden I feel so. So underachieved. Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, that's a great, that's a great thought process, right? That's a great philosophy to have that at the end of the year. And, and again, uh, was it imposter syndrome you used? Not beating yourself up about it, coming to the end of the year and celebrating all the wins that you had mm-hmm. rather than just focusing on the fact that, well, you know, I said I was going to buy 40 units in three years and I got 39. So I must be a total loser, you mm-hmm. know, focusing on all the wins you had being what really made what your journey was all about. So fantastic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's that quote, I I forget how it goes, but it's if you shoot for the moon, and even if you don't get that, you'll still land among the stars, something like that. Right. No, and that's very true. That's very, very true. So Rachel, what most people ask this, most people ask this question of people my age, but I'm going to ask this (laughs) of you. When you look back at your very short career. (laughs) And I mean that with uh, a lot of admiration and uh, and a ton of respect. But when you look at your very short career, what is it you could have done more of? (laughs) (laughs) What I could have done more of. (laughs) I'm sorry. It's normally a question I ask, but when you look at what you've done, what what, what were some of the things that you should have done some more of that would have advanced it further, faster, farther? Well, here, there's a few ways I held myself back. Um, Number one, I, I've always held myself back by being too frugal, being too cheap. This is a character flaw I've recognized. Most people are on the opposite end. You know, they're spending too much money, but anything at an extreme is not good. So right. I was on, I was being too cheap, too frugal. Um, there's a few ways that that came back to harm me. So I would love to tell a story about property management gone wrong. Is that I'd okay? Love, I'd love to hear a story about property management gone wrong. <laughs> Biggest mistake I've ever made. So when my husband and I looked to first hire property manager, we were self-managing about 26 units at that point, oh, still yeah, working. Easy. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah. Still working full time. And I was writing my book in the evening, so we couldn't do it anymore. So we were looking for a property management company, but there was a couple, a husband and wife that had been working for us already. They were doing things like cleaning the common areas, some of the maintenance, lawn care. They were truly two of the hardest working people I've ever met, always went above and beyond. So we thought to ourselves, well, what if we hire this couple as employees of our company? That way we can probably save some money and be a little bit more hands-on with the way that they're managing the properties. So that's what we did. That was our big mistake. So fast forward about six months in, my husband went to collect rent from the lockboxes on site one Saturday. He realized there was a lot of rent missing. And it wasn't just a normal tenant paying late. It was a significant chunk. So of course, we're calling this couple. What's going on? You know, do you guys know what's going on? We never heard from them again after that day. And it turns out they stole $6,000 in rent income that weekend. And we found out that they'd been squatting in vacant rooms and units on our properties for almost a year. 
So what a wake up call. I mean, it was horrendous at the time, total violation of trust, obviously just awful. We can laugh about it now though, but the moral of the story is this isn't the place to be cheap. No, you know, you need to hire a properly licensed, bonded, insured, reputable property management company. Because if we had done that and one of their employees had stolen rent money from us, they would have been liable for the damages, not us. So, I mean, the lesson learned is, yeah, I mean, maybe I saved a couple dollars for those first six months, but it cost me a lot more in the long run. So well, don't be cheap. You know, the other thing too, that I look at is more, more from a uh, asset management standpoint than a property management standpoint, right? That's why, I mean, I do have a property management company. I've got some great people that work with me there in that endeavor, because the reality is there's times when you need to spend a little extra money to get a little extra in rent. And the dividend that that pays, sometimes I err where you do, right? My wife hates going to the grocery store with me because I tell her, put that back, get this one here, it's $3 cheaper. Well, uh, you know, but I like this one. But the reality is when it comes to property management, making sure that you're, you're putting in the quality and the, the uh, finishes in the, in the units that are going to get you the top rents are, are going to return so much more than the sixty dollars you saved by going with the ultra cheap microwave, or the you know the the discontinued tile that you got on sale, or some of the things that I've done, because you've done that exact same thing. You've over analyzed the value of the savings, and you've milked it to the point that you've hurt yourself on future cash flow and potential earning income and potential value. Because as we know, rental properties trade based on the ROI, right? Yeah, so, exactly. So that's that's funny. You and I have a very similar trait. So when my wife watches this episode, she will go, aha. Uh-huh. <laughs> so yeah, and that's like recurring theme in my life. I mean, I've always been too frugal. I'm it's good I'm aware of it at least. So I can I can watch out for that. You fight that tendency? Um, what'd you say? You could fight that tendency. I can try. I can try to fight it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I feel like another good example too, of how I held myself back is just trying to do too much on my own, especially mm-hmm. with my book business. Mm-hmm. I got to a point where, and this was right after I quit my job. And so suddenly I could work my, for myself full time. And I realized, okay, this is fun, but what do I do now? How do I scale this? How do I grow now that I have time I can actually invest in it? And it took me a while, but I finally hired a mentor because I realized, yeah, I could keep hitting a wall. I could keep costing myself time and money trying to figure it out all on my own, or I could hire an expert and surround myself with people that are already 10 steps ahead of me because that's the way I'm going to grow the fastest. Right. So that's been a big lesson for me as well. Again, it takes money to make money, right? It does. Yes. It's been a little bit. Well, Rachel, thank you so much for your time. Before we go though. Tell us where we can find you. Where can we order your book? How can we get in touch with you? Thank you. Yeah. So both of my books, Money, Honey and Passive Income Aggressive Retirement are available on Amazon in ebook, paperback and audio. Um, You can follow me on Instagram at Money, Honey, Rachel. And what I'd love to do for your listeners is if anyone wants to download my passive income starter kit, I will give that for free. And you can go to moneyhoneyrachel.com slash bonus to download it. Great. That is so awesome. Thank you, Rachel. Guys, I hope you got as much out of this from a 28-year-old retiree. Too bad she's got to wait for Social Security for another 30 years. But uh, <laughs> Rachel, we want to thank you very much for coming by the Real Estate Rundown. We, we uh, look forward to seeing your next book and seeing where the journey takes you. Thank you so much for having me on. We'll talk soon. Thanks, guys, for tuning in to the Real Estate Rundown. <laughs>